Well, thank you very much all for coming. Um, James has introduced himself individually to most of you, but this is um, Lieutenant Colonel James Cook. He was a student of mine on ACSC 13, he reminds me, because I didn't really remember. And um, so you've been doing your PhD for four years on learning in the First World War, and he's found some amazing stuff in archives. Um, you think there might be not much more to learn about the First World War, but actually there's so much more to be uncovered, and James is going to... Um, treat us to some of the uh, highlights of some of his work he's already done. So I'll leave you to speak for the next half an hour or so. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming and, and humouring me this afternoon. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, as Helen said, uh, I fell into this four years ago in a slightly different direction and then found learning and training doctrine as a piece that I felt had been underexposed. Uh, I find this fascinating, but I appreciate it might not be to everybody. So I will go through the next half an hour and let you know where I currently am. Uh, fourth year PhD student, PhD student, currently commanding a reserve regiment in Scotland, soon to move to the west coast to go to the Army Personnel Centre to muck up gunner careers. Um, and I consider myself an amateur historian and a professional soldier. There's my context. Um, I'm going to go through this, but I'm going to show you 41 words on about slide 14. Just 41 words. And I think they're the most powerful 41 words written in doctrine in the whole of the First World War. And they're completely spurious, but that's my build-up, build up to that bit. And that, to me, is one of those things you find in an archive one day, find a book and go, oh my God, the war changed. For a reason you'd have no, you would skim over, but that's where I'm going with it. Um, so the format, uh, confirm what I mean by various terms, set the conditions, move quickly onto setting the scene, Boer War, how we fell into the First World War, unpick the learning process on the Western Front uh, for the British Expeditionary Force. And this is bounded, Western Front, BEF. Then look at the evolution of the books and the pamphlets that's actually set out our doctrine. Uh, but it's vital we look at where those ideas came from, who got them, who corralled them, and who published them. Uh, and I'll look at the doctrinal organisation, how we actually achieved what we needed to achieve. Uh, so some definitions. And of course, with all things definitions, these are my definitions. Uh, NATO defines doctrine as fundamental principles by which the military forces guide their actions in support of objectives. It is authoritative but requires judgment in application. And that very definition itself could kill you, couldn't it? Uh, this suits the presentation. However, I also like the central idea of an army and also doctrine is what is taught. You know, I like the last one because it's simple, which is good for gunners. Uh, sitting below doctrine uh, and bridging the military gap, uh, military gap are tactics. Uh, these are defined as the art of organising an army, the techniques for using weapons of military units in combination for engaging and defeating an enemy in battle. We're all happy with that. But we must realise that one is the product of the other. But which way round? More later. Uh, training within the First World War is divided into subjective areas. Uh, firstly, training for either individuals or collections of people. Uh, secondly, training is either before combat uh, such as initial com uh, training back in depot in the UK, or post-combat, uh, such as continuation training. Uh, thirdly, training is either home or abroad, uh, benign or inside of the battlefield. And fourthly, training is either classroom-based or field-based. And it's very self. Training becomes very complex. So with this in mind, I just ask that we talk about training is we don't think of this as training. This is the easy part. We think of the complex just behind the battle line within the smell of the trenches and the range of the guns. Training may be defined as the acquisition of knowledge, skills and competencies as a result of the teaching of vocational practical skills and knowledge that relates to specific useful competencies. That's one way of taking it and it's a very long hard definition to unpick. And then finally the learning process that underpins training, doctrine and tactics must be understood. Uh, learning may be defined as the acquisition of knowledge and skills that I've said, and in the first instance it's hard to distinguish between learning and training. In this paper the distinction is simple. Training is how individuals and groups are educated, whilst learning is the process by which new ideas and concepts are brought into training. So to clarify, there is a subtle but very important difference between doctrine and tactics, which is sometimes lost on people. Doctrine is higher level concepts, tactics of the application. Conversely, the tactics of the military practices and require far more detail and prescriptive techniques and procedures. Tactics refer to the way forces fight, not the way they're organised and equipped. And here endeth the lesson on tactics because this is about doctrine, training and learning. 
So, how do you win a war? If I could answer this, I would promote myself to four-star general overnight. Obviously, but I can't. But what I think is, there is an eternal question that has wrapped the brains of every military commander, and it's hard to answer. Study talks of nature versus character, and currently this is articulated in our doctrine of the future character of conflict paper by DCDC. They state that, and I, and I paraphrase, the nature of war is enduring, it's a clash of wills. It depends on the might of the forces available and then that technological edge. The contemporary Western forces are rushing towards a technological advantage at the expense of mass. And of course, the forces in Ukraine border remind us that quality, sorry, quantity has a quality all of its own. Uh, the nature of war changes little in its death and destruction, blood and guts. The clash of opposing forces and the mobilisation of the home front and civilian populations. It is about political strength as much as military might. Fundamentally, it is about forcing your opponent to believe that they are beaten and outmatching them intellectually. Hence, the character of war changes continuously. So, some topics we'd all be familiar with. Command. We're all compelled by the ability of various military leaders uh, and political masters. Was Haig a genius or a fool? Did Dr. Did Dr. Andy Simpson make much of the ability of the core commanders and their abilities of battles and tactics, or was he on a red herring? He suggests they quickly became the most appropriate level at which to command and control the British Expeditionary Force at core level. Hence, we ask ourselves if eventually Gough, Rawlinson and Maxitel were up to the job, or inadvertently the people there at the time. Many other writers suggest it was superior command that enabled victory. We must realise that in the Great War, command was exercised at many levels, from platoon commander all the way through to army commanders. But did it really matter? Uh, the enemy. Uh, many themes for victory evolve around the competency of the enemy, their tactics, quality of the soldiers, and their technological edge and morale. They're very compelling and fundamental, but do they really matter in a near-peer army? The home front. Uh, the ability to mobilise the workforce, maintain healthy economy, drive the production, sustain the country underpins military success, obviously. Without that, we couldn't have achieved, and maybe it was the unpicking of the German forces in 1918. It was only with this mobilisation that we had the raw economy and resources to succeed. Technology. Technology is another compelling theme for Allied victory. While many misguided views consider the First World War of a battle of ineptitude and no imagination, I suggest that any military that can invent or develop the fighter aircraft, the tank, the submarine, radio communications, chemical warfare, sound ranging, and my favourite, the L106 artillery fuse, is a military with imagination and technology on its side. However, was it fundamental to victory? Fundamental. Did it give us the edge the enemy didn't have, or were the enemy doing the same and maintaining parity? Tactics. Uh, it feels that everyone has a view on First World War tactics and what their evolution meant towards victory. Uh, the writings of John Terrain, Sanders Marble, Gary Sheffield, Tim Travis all suggest that it was the evolution of military tactics and keeping ahead of the army that allowed victory. I'm not so sure. I'm not saying I disagree with those such illustrious writers, but I'm not so sure. Bite and hold versus breakthrough, rolling barrage versus pre-recorded targets, integration of tanks with infantry, or simple destruction by artillery. All very good tactical changes, but were they fundamental? It's a compelling argument, and as times change we get on board with it. From Napoleonic to the level of combined arms warfare we see today, technology apparently leads. But was it fundamental? Uh, so some context. Prior to setting off in 1914, we must understand the state of the British Army. Uh, the British Army at the time owed its success to Sir Richard Haldane, who was in 1908 the Secretary of State for War. Haldane's, Haldane's reluctant genius uh, lays in his identification of five requirements to reform in 1904 as a result of the indifferent performance in the Boer War. And as I say these five, just think of actually how these come together to make a new army. First, the War Office needed to be organised. Second, the British Army needed a general staff. Thirdly, a grand strategy for the Army was needed that accompanied both the needs of the Empire and any coming continental war. Fourth, the reserves needed dramatic, drastic reorganisation. And fifthly, the Army needed to build and train an expeditionary force. I would just jump in now 
and say as a commander of a reserve regiment struggling with future reserves 2020, what Haldane published in 1904 and had done by 1908 is probably streaks ahead of where we are today. And many of the ideas that Future Reserves 2020 says about restructuring, we first had in 1904. Anyway, that's another day. Uh, with the structural changes engineered by Haldane and the British Army's reinvention of its tactical doctrine, which is set out in F Field, Services, Field Service Regulations 1909, we made leaps ahead. The Dominion forces were encouraged to follow and lead and read and procure. The tactics of fire and manoeuvre, combined arms, and equal, equal emphasis on defence and offence represent the output of field service regulations. The British adopted and trained on these tactics. The army shook the anti-intellectualism anti of the Victorian area within 15 years, fielded an army that stood on equal footing with the best in Europe. The army had trained the new organisations of divisions and corps to fight on a modern battlefield. The officer corps became more professional, staff college was reborn, and attendance increased. The army drastically altered training at all levels and funded it accordingly to realise these new changes. And all this happened within 10 years. And hence we get to my premise of learning, which is quite simple. It was that this little book enabled victory. I'm sorry I haven't brought one with me today. I forgot it. It's on my desk in Edinburgh. Awful. It is this publication and those that followed it that set the conditions for victory and enabled command technology and tactics to actually matter. I now expand on this theory, uh, but in simple terms, I believe that underpinning command technology and tactics was the British forces' ability to learn. Learning. Uh, this paper considers learning in its widest context, uh, the learning curve or not, and its associated constituent parts offers a plethora of topics to be considered. The learning process breaks down into identifying lessons, recording those lessons, deciding what to do about those lessons, and then training those lessons before assessing how we got on and probably repeating. In simple terms, it's about identifying a problem, devising a solution, and then teaching. The topic also brings other thorny questions to light, such as, was learning driven from the bottom up or top down, and does it really matter? Was learning formalised at all? Was learning reactionary or predictive? Was learning controlled or free-ranging? We must then add the context for ensuring that we're talking about collective training, i.e. how the body of the army learned, rather than just individuals. I'll unpick these in a moment, but I'd like to touch on how we learned and split it into a couple of sections. The first I call reactive. This includes the immediate lessons whereby soldiers and officers in the front line develop ideas and practices that increase their lifespan and chance of survival, i.e. not getting dead. They're incredibly short term and very immediate. They are low level and probably include just their local command of command or maybe one across and one up. So a platoon of infantry with a good idea may spread it to its fellow platoons and its company but it's unlikely to go much further. It is not endorsed. This is very much a practical change in techniques. Reactive learning is driven by the immediate necessity to not get dead. The other end of the scale is adaptive learning. This is the means by which larger entities, like the British Expeditionary Force, adapt as time go by. It's a distillation of lots of reactive learning and a synthesis of the best ideas. They are then formalised, codified and written down. They are judged by committee and commanders, rigorous examination and then published. Most importantly though, they are then resourced with training time and equipment and even more importantly are formally shared amongst other units. This spreads the good ideas and makes them into eventually tactical concepts. So this process is more top down and formal but is originally re derived from reactive lessons from the bottom up. And I should jump in here and state that it's almost impossible to distinguish between top-down, bottom-up. Uh, the way the BEF learnt their lessons from the harsh experience of the battle is probably the most intangible part of my thesis and, the, and of contemporary academic study. It is subjective primarily due to the paucity of material available. However, firstly, commanders for various reasons are reluctant 
to read the lessons from their forebears and consider such an intellectual approach unhelpful, instead relying on their own military intellect, training and judgement. As I believe, they're inherently arrogant about their own abilities. Secondly, nations never fight the same war twice, so there's sound reason for ignoring previous campaign success and how it was done. So these two initial factors prevent commanders taking much from previous campaigns and maybe previous doctrine. But they should not stop the process of recording the lessons from history and then trying to impose their findings on new generations. There is good work to be done. I believe that learning occurs at every level of the army. What is different is how it's formally recognised and transformed into doctrine. On the basis that doctrine is written at high level and then sent down towards the fighting units, it is often represented as a top-down approach. However, it seems most likely that new concepts are invented by necessity at the front line and are sent from the bottom up to be ratified and codified. Learning lessons and disseminating them quickly so they may be absorbed into the doctrinal mass is vital to development. General Headquarters of the BEF in France modified its structure to include to the General Staff a General Staff Duties branch primarily for this purpose in 1917. The new branch provided the staff power and the administration so that training integration for the new divisions could be brought into line. GHQ issued the first of a long series of notes on recent fighting in 1916. Note number seven was issued two weeks after the opening Battle of Lys and stressed the importance, amongst other things, of holding flanks and breakthrough and set about trying to improve the situation. Drivers for change. Uh, the experience of the participants must have been important as it drove the need for change, not getting dead. Soldiers and officers at unit level understood the need for change if they were to survive. It was their experience of seeing at first hand what worked and what didn't that contributed to this pressure for change. Far too many private diaries and journals of the first two years of the war bemoan that artillery, gunners, and its lack of imagination, not surprising, in the creeping or rolling barrages was habitually too slow to react. The young platoon commanders didn't integrate with responsible gunners until far too late in late 1915 and then they started to work it out. But it needed some ingenious schooling systems. It was this experience that led to the new tactics at the lowest level. Experiences led to battery commanders changing how they sighted their guns, how sappers would forward load their military supplies, and how the Royal Flying Corps would communicate with the artillery observers to move barrages. But probably the most intuitive change instigated at lower levels with the level of cooperation and discussion on how to execute these plans. The breaking of inter-armed rivalries and assumed arrogance allowed far more intimate cooperation at the levels where it really mattered, at the, matters of, at the levels of life and death. Uh, new technology. Tanks, gas, sound ranging, the 106 fuse, the Royal Flying Corps, radios, the sliding block artillery breach, etc. all did more and made us more lethal, and we expended less blood and treasure. The aims and goals of earlier campaigns were now achieved for far less resources. As such, confident commanders could take on more with less and still succeed. The enemy, enemy always had a vote and reacting to the enemy tactics certainly drove some of our doctrine in the early days. So moving on to how the BEF developed its fighting style. Many contemporary commentators suggest that the fledging ideas grew from the bottom up and drove change. The novel practices were eventually codified by doctrine, as I've already said, and taught as army throughout the army schools. The theory is personified by the works of Tim Travers, Gary Sheffield et al. However, whilst compelling, I think it might be flawed. I think. If it were the case, how do we account for the relative uniformity of fighting style across the division in the various corps and armies? If development was driven from the bottom up, how did the army groups adapt so readily and equip the fighting force so well and coherently? To suggest that bottom-up is viable suggests that the relatively dogmatic and process-driven GHQ had to accept that its command was subservient to the ideas of lesser men. Awkward. I find it far more compelling to suggest that a requirement of change was identified at all levels of command. It was probably felt most at the lowest level, but if the army commanders were not oblivious to this need. It is with this in mind that my theory of adaptive and reactive learning blend together with the motivation for change and the burning necessity to do better than before. Hence, for us to accept that the binary solution of top-down or bottom-up is misguided and we should be replaced by a sense of all-round multi-directional learning. 
So what was actually written down and what divisions and brigades based their fighting styles upon? Well, by 1916, and there wasn't much before, there was plenty of doctrine around. It seems that it was well circulated and that many officers actually read it, unlike today, uh, and actually understood it. Uh, however, let us not forget the utility of Field Service Regulations 1909. The two small books stood the test of times. Preeminent doctrine, trained for and equipped for before the First World War, and still in service by the end of the First World War. Uh, in 1916, the first draft, uh, first fighting drafts were released of SS 119, Notes on the Tactical Lessons of Recent Operations. And they outlined the initial thoughts on how to organise and fight better at company and battalion level. It was a collection of these ideas from the early days of the Somme that set out the heart of better cooperation within the arms and services. Uh, a year later, this had transformed into SS-135, which not only highlighted the big ideas of fire and movement and reinforced their utility and platoon tactics, but more importantly, set out how the BEF would train in France. And this is late 1916. Again, by 1918, this doctrine had morphed into a complete work on how a division would attack and major an artillery barrage cooperation, using the Flying Corps and setting the conditions for the, ex for the exploitation by the cavalry. These three key stages of BEF doctrine must not be underestimated, and their impact and adherence allowed not new commanders to focus on what really mattered, to gain and hold ground for less loss of blood and treasure. Uh, the origins of SS 135, Stationary Service 135 I should say, uh, instructions for the training of divisions for offensive actions, November 1916, republished August 1917, set the example by which this would be done. But before I wade on, a reality check. Uh, it appears that this work was not that of a great committee of experts, all exercising their experience and opinion. These doctrinal notes were the work of a small group of determined men who were well informed and understood the need for change. The actual job was in assessing how the French and British were fighting, trying to establish best methods, and then blending these techniques so they could be implemented army-wide, understood by all, and be flexible enough to succeed in most situations. There was a key skill in achieving this, and this was done by groups of men of four or five, and this one in particular led by Lieutenant Colonel Cuthbert Hedlum, a young yeomanry officer. Hence, 135 was probably written by Hedlum and a team of at most four people, sent for checking and authorisation and then their acceptance at BEF and GHU level, but the staff work was by a group of four or five people. If this was the case, and the facts are lost to history, but it seems likely, it's a speedy and accurate format. It's actually very similar to how doctrine is written today, and it focuses on getting the best from as few people as possible. Uh, the next two slides merely show how prolific doctrine became quite quickly. They cover the core principles and platoon details. There's another 140 pamphlets by the end of the World War on various topics. Uh, the only criticism is that their production didn't get underway until early 1916, and we have the first 18 lost months of the war. I thus put it to you that it was no coincidence that we got better as we published readable, exploitable and manageable doctrine in this form. This slide emphasises how much time and effort doctrine placed on how to train, not just what to train. These books also acted as orders, as their very existence, signed off by Chief of General, Imperial General Staff, gave lower commanders the resources and times to set up schools to teach this doctrine. It was very much a case of short-term loss for training gain, and it seemed to work. I'll also touch on another learning mechanism. We've talked about adaptive and reactive, but the utility of schools is also in the sharing of experience and location of ideas to be put into practice. At any one time, these schools would have a wealth of expert pupils and a wealth of expert instructors. They could share ideas with each other, and more importantly, with other branches of their own army. In these schools, there was no immediate pressure to survive from day to day, so intellectual practice and development could take place. Gunners even talked to sappers. But enough of that. The Royal Flying Corps could explain the difficulties of communication with the cavalry and the infantry, and progress was made. Now, most historians agree on the importance of the platoon as the basic fighting unit, but as the war progressed, the significance of the company may well have taken over. But, and it's a big but, the platoon maintained primacy towards the end as the building block of the fighting force. Its subaltern platoon commander 
and trusted platoon sergeant with the lowest level of formal command. How the platoons trained and reacted is crucial to success of the BF. Hence the significance of the platoon tactics publications I'm showing that came pouring out of the doctrine centres in the latter stages of the war. Now these documents cover training equipment, low level tactics, etc, etc, but they were very accessible and very well written. As the titles show, it wasn't all about rifles and bayonets either, but bombing, patrolling and Lewis guns, to name but three. So, on to what I believe is a seminal publication, Stationary Service 143, The Training and Employment of Platoons. A single publication that did more to win the war than, in my opinion, any other publication, and that includes the famous Health and Hygiene in the Field publication, which may have saved many lives. Uh, this was the building block, a pamphlet that occurred, offered such hints as every group of men, specialists or not, must have a definitive commander. Every man in the ranks, not armed as a specialist, must be trained to replace uh, specialist casualties, so they all were multidisciplined. The training of men in the platoon must be carried out by the leader of that platoon. Such simple ideas, but before then, it wasn't the case. So here's my big slide. Have a read. In my opinion, some of the most powerful words in doctrine in the First World War. Just 41 of them. These are the utterly pragmatic orders that had probably already been accepted by the middle of the war, but here was ratification and formal acceptance. I'm particularly taken by a platoon commander positioning statement. Every junior officer believed that their only place in the battle was to leave from the front, to be the first up the ladder and over the trench. It was what they were taught. This is very noble and commendable, but useless tactically, as it meant led to their early or immediate death. Then, without the decision maker, the remaining platoon would eventually fall into disarray as momentum would be lost. Hence, these orders in SS143 allow the junior officer to be placed themselves in a far better position for command, more pragmatic, and they lived longer. The platoon maintained momentum and they could react to the situation. And with one small sentence, which resulted in a significant increase in junior officer survivability, meant the army could learn because the platoon commander wasn't dead. The commander survived, wrote down their experiences, and doctrine flourished. Uh, the last piece of the jigsaw was the implementation of two staffs departments. The training directorate and the inspectorate of training were tools established at GHQ to push training to new levels. Whilst many laid the credit at General Maxey, uh, at the bottom there, excuse me, it's the rather unknown Brigadier Arthur Solly Flood who was actually responsible for the majority of the implementation, top right. Solly Flood was brought to GHQ in February 1917 to inaugurate the Training Directorate for all arms and services within the BF so that new tactical doctrine could be staffed and then disseminated and provide for the coordination of all training, whether carried out under GHQ, the Army's corps or divisions. Uh, he had commanded 35 Brigade, he had been the Commandant of 3rd Army Officer School, and he was perfectly placed. As the director was vital to changing fortunes with the BF, a short analysis of him is warranted. The true nature of his career is lost because his diaries have never been found. But he went through every level of command, and at every level of command had an opportunity to train and be responsible for the training of his soldiers. He was a perfect choice. During his influential appointment to the training director, Solly Flood opportunity to show his imagination and excellence was never questioned. At this time, the BF success had been sporadic and it wrestled with new technology, equipment, tactics and changing political imperatives. In late November 16, he was one of the officers that joined the French 4th Division to see what their new tactics and techniques were. He went with uh, General Curry, uh, GOC 1st Canadian Division and later Corps Commander of the Canadian Corps. And they saw the friendship practice wrote down, brought back, and then assimilated their ideas. This next step in enabling this evaluation was the establishment of the Inspectorate in spring 1918, a small staff of officers who acted as the auditors of what Solly had set up in the training teams. So now we had doctrine being published, a team to codify and collectively train it, and people to check what was training. We had assurance. Uh, uniformity in doctrine was only one half of the problem. Just as important was the need to standardise teaching of doctrine across the schools. 
With a unified syllabus, it would be irrelevant if the teaching wasn't unified as well. This requirement fell to Solly Flood and his team in the spring of 1917, and it seems to have worked tremendously well. Before the war, little had been thought about training during operations. They wouldn't last that long. And now we set up over 90 schools in France and Belgium. They needed coordination. Uh, by late 1917, we were training 100 NCOs and 100 officers per four-week course per uh, army school. Those were cascading down to the core schools and divisional at the same rates of one to four. This meant that we could bring new ideas and new techniques and procedures, but more importantly, new doctrine, to army groups within 12 weeks, which is pretty agile. While some direction had been given in 16, it really fell to Solid Flood to implement this system and to make this doctrine so agile and reactive. Now, it does appear he went back to first principles in designing the system. SS 152, published in June 17, defined all the strands of BF training policy in France and gave this coordination. He then describes this in training doctrine and is importantly in SS 135 and 143 translates that into the tactics that will be taught. He over overarchingly set out the why, where and how and resourced it in co coherent policy. He based his training on two principles that the responsibility for the training and the efficiency of all officers and men belonged to the commanding officer. Before then, not confirmed. And that they had to train specialist instructors at army schools to bring out army doctrine to be covered by the commanding officers. So these two concepts, the CO's responsible and that he would be given specialist trainers, allowed them to train to the doctrine that had been de developed. With this in mind, Solid Flood sets up this BR of hierarchy and all of a sudden the BEF is training army groups, as I said, in 12 weeks with new and continuous changes in doctrine. I feel, and whilst it's hard to uh, quantify, this is quicker than Germans can react to as we outmatch them in our intellectual thinking. Uh, the final component of training uh, was whether it in the front line or in the reserves, uh, rever uh, sorry, of the front line in either support or in rever reserve. Later in the war, General Maxey hints that he established the true myth of training was that it wasn't the creation of the inspection of training, but the ideas of every soldier. However, before they were published, SS 152 laid down both overarching principles and detailed examples of the nature of the training required in order to generate success. He goes on to talk about individual and collective training and the primacy of both, the location and suitability of training and what had to be done and what, in which order and where with what resources. Fundamentally, by the end of 1917, we have a coherent training system to put in place the doctrine we'd written the year before, but which is ever evolving. It's with these issues in mind that we see the benefit of the ratified training system and the schools in Belgium and France, the Solid Flood, that he then eventually handed over to Maxi in 1918, would develop. Very conscious that I'm a little bit behind. I will now go on to... Um, so to conclude, so what? Academia has written widely about the methods of war, about tactics and about the units that fought. And I hope I've given you in the last 35 minutes an idea of the unglamorous topic of learning its constituent parts, adaptive reactors, uh, adaptive and reactive. Learning is not fashionable or well documented. It's quite ethereal and it's hard to fathom. But without it, the British extraordinary force would have stagnated and have been behind the German learning process themselves. In, same, in contemporary conflict, the same issues dog ourselves and our allies as we try to be as agile as each other. How we learn from our mistakes and develop remains a contentious but excruciatingly important issue. It's just a, a great shame we don't find enough time to look at our own history and see how our predecessors have done it better than us. In the next six or seven months, I hope to clarify and codify the rest of this information and outline in the rest of my thesis how the British Expeditionary Force succeeded on the Western Front through its learning, constituent parts, doctrine and training, and that it was more important fundamentally than technology, command and leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. We've got time for a few questions. Has anyone, anyone got a question? Well, you emphasised uh, the, um, well, first of all, thank you very much, because that, that was very interesting, but um, uh, you, you, you emphasised the importance of the platoon commander, the mm. What was the, um, 
but want to a better word, what was the machinery for capturing this? Did platoon commanders have that much time to write down their experiences and send it back through the chain? Were they encouraged to do so? Did they have much opportunity? Were the facilities for them to do that in terms of, well, the, 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 the sort of the um, office machinery, if you like, but was, was that available uh, to, to any great extent for them? It's an area I went into and spent a couple of weeks looking at, and the key piece of technological equipment was the leading bit of kit that was the most sought after item in the trench in the day, the typewriter, today's iPad 4. And of course they were banned in the trenches in the first two years because they were to spread ideas that weren't wanted by the rest of GHQ, they were held at core level and above, and by 1917 typewriters had been, you know, everyone got a typewriter for Christmas as we get an iPad in Afghanistan. And I believe because you start seeing platoon commander's diaries go from handwritten to typewriting, tip typewritten, and their platoon commander's diaries, so he had his own typewriter somehow, at great expense, that must have helped spread good ideas. Because I can read their typewritten diaries, I can't read their handwritten ones because it's just so whatever. So I think you have the mechanism in the technologies there to support it. I also think that we reinvest in our platoon commanders by 1917 and actually say, no, these are a good fighting level. Because you know, when we go to war, we're fighting divisions. Divisions are the big hands. And then actually the next year, brigades we give some missions to, and then eventually back brigades and battalions. But by 1718, companies and platoons are getting bespoke specific tasks. We trust their platoon commanders. So I think that's a second bit of evidence that they are being invested in. Thirdly, all the doctrine that comes out has a distribution list in the front, and it goes down to company level times three. So at company level times three, that might be for the company commander and his 2IC, but you hope the platoon commanders might get a copy as well. Now, you would have four platoon commanders probably, but there would have been enough to let people read them. So if you've got the technology, the time, and the doctrine, and you're being invested in, I think the platoon commanders are being in a good place. But that is all subjective. That's how I read it. There's nothing that's ever said, as a platoon commander, I could do more. That's what I'm, that's what I'm surmising. Okay. Okay. James, I, I was so captivated by the wording of SS 143, I, I missed the date that that was promulgated. Um. Uh, 143 got updated a few times. So those words there, yeah. that's uh, November 16, I think, isn't it? I said there. Yeah. November 16 or January 17, it's at that stage. Yeah. Which is, of course, really? it's post SOM, yeah. when we, we lost a lot of platoon commanders and lost the ability to learn. It, the, this is really fascinating to me because I've been involved in both the TELIC and LME lessons processes. What I find profoundly depressing is I think it's partially a function of our embarrassment over Iraq. Mm. People haven't been prepared to get much above the, the tactical level lessons. And across the road in DC, DC, I was profoundly depressed when it came to the Libya thing. I actually had one one star saying, oh, ta tactical stuff, we've got you know, banks of the tactical lessons, and that's sufficient. And I'm making the point that you know we, we need to pull it all together in an sort of analytical narrative. But this contentment with mm. the tactical level lessons, I think, is permeating defence. And I just wondered if you could, you know, offer your thoughts on that. Is it out of embarrassment over what what happened in Iraq? You know, a lot of people said, I don't want anybody judging me for my performance in Iraq, therefore I am pulling the hard drive out of my computer and I'm not certainly not going to leave any sort of hard copy anywhere. Um, and it's, it's just uh, something that really concerns me and in light of you know, how good we used to be at this business. Uh, I hadn't considered it and as you say it now, I never served in Iraq, I actually missed it. I was an Afghan man for a couple of times. but I. I what you say is compelling, I then counter that by saying that the Army Knowledge Exchange publishes thousands of very low-level ideas of just which way to turn your magazine in your pouch and upwards. I think you could probably relate what you're saying to the loss of appetite for risk uh, and you know the what happens if you get it wrong on operations. We've seen to a Royal Marine Sergeant who fundamentally got it wrong in every way, but that doesn't help anybody else's case if they think on the edge of that. Um, I think as we come out next year, we will be self We will be very happy where we are, and we'll be very set for the next campaign, which will look nothing like that one. But I'll finish by saying I don't know if I necessarily saw junior officers afraid to share their ideas. 
I think the junior officers and the senior NCOs were very happy to share their ideas. I would say there was a reluctance to do much about it at, let me say, the one star level. Because actually, if you were the task force commander in Helmand, effectively a divisional commander really, with the level of span of command and the assets you had, I don't think they had the wherewithal or the time or the staff set up to actually do something about it. At no stage in task force Helmand do we actually have a system to make ourselves better. We had lessons identified, lessons learned, we had warmness to capturing them, and we had this process of doing back into predictable training. But actually, we didn't have the equivalent of GCHQ, GHQ in Afghanistan doing the training directorate or the inspectorate. Uh, and it took the BEF four years to do it. So we should have got round to it in Afghanistan. I think I'm waffling on your very good question. I'm not sure if you've any, any experience, Andy? Was it Andy? Sorry. Alex. Alex, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I was out on the, one of the later Herricks where I would say the it still wasn't smooth enough to get the circle completed, but it was a lot better in as much as the um, there were things kids dumping, such as muddy boot controls, for example, where someone would come and go with you and, um, as an observer, neutral observer, and then when you got back in, you wouldn't do anything while you're out there. When you got back in, you'd then say, What I'm recommending is you change this to this because recently something else happened. So I think the circle is, mm. was, it didn't necessarily need the forward deployed team in Afghanistan to make it work because the technology was mm. It is ironic that with so much technology, we were no better spreading our lessons than we were by typewriter in 1916. Mm. I, I don't think we were. I mean, it's hard to, hard to quantify, but it doesn't seem we were any better. But there again, when was the last time any of our platoon commanders or company commanders were given a document book and said, read it, now do it like that? Mm. Whereas the mentality of the First World War was, here's a doctrine, read it, do it like that. And I, I, I assume, because it seems to have happened. I don't want to hog the discussion mm. period, but it strikes me that the Americans have a philosophy of learning in a way that hasn't quite permeated our system, where we still regard courses here at this place as a tick in the box rather than uh, building that sort of mindset of through life education and learning as you, as you find I, I think culturally they're in a very different place in terms of how they deal with their servicemen and women, their veterans and their learning and their intellectual development. And actually, it makes us what we are and it makes them what we are, who they are. And if we were a bit more like them, that might scare us. Uh, no, I agree. I mean, I've been studying for four years with the great support of Helen and, and the Academy here, but no one else in the Army can give a monkey's about what I'm doing. And when I complete my PhD in how an Army learns, no one will post me to an appointment in the Army where that's useful. Not that I ever wanted it to, but it would be nice. James, yeah. sorry. Um, how much? Um, nice to meet you. Did the re reaction of the captured German doctrine affect what's been written? I know that a lot of notes from the front and it's yeah. prescribed out to a certain level, but I know in the archive that the captured German translated German doctrine was not to be pushed further forward than X or Y. So how did it get out, and was it well used? Um, I think about by 1918, a third of what we're publishing is just what the opposition are doing, whether it's their doctrine or their TTPs or lessons from the German offences, especially from their spring offensive. And we seem to get it up to battalion level, but not much further forward. Mm. I don't think it went much further forward because I don't think it changed much, mm. actually, because we were near peer throughout the whole of the, whole of the war, and success probably came because of other factors instead of the tactics being used. But uh, we tried very hard to capture what the Germans were doing and the enemy force were doing. I don't know if we exploited it, but I don't know if it made much of a difference. Mm. Uh, but you, as you say, you know it's all published. Mm. There are lots of stuff. You know, here's their here's their doctrine, and they took it from everywhere. Mm. Uh, there, there was a really respectful arms race in doctrine as we went up and up through the ladder, and we both evolved fantastically in fifty months. Mm. I don't think anyone really got the edge. I don't know. I mean, you can pick any one area, but no one really ever was better at command, tactics, and leadership doctrine enough any one stage to make it to make us win. Until obviously November 1918, mm. supposedly. So, so that's the Germans, and they were the enemy we were fighting, but we were fighting with the French, who were our allies. So, have you come across anything in your research about? Um, their process of learning and whether there was any kind of exchange of ideas or interface between what you've been describing here and, the, and a sort of either similar interlinked or parallel process going on in the French Army? Um, sadly, because I knew I was going behind, I skipped that slide, but very much so. Solly Flood, within two months, goes and watch the French Fourth Army, watch theirs. They have a training company, they have a demonstration company, and he watched their new tactics. It's from that 
from that meeting, he goes there with a couple of one, uh, two stars and three stars British. They come back and have a conference. There's notes from the conference in the paper, uh, headland papers, I think. Um, and there's lots of handwritten notes. And it is six months later, we go to a new all bat, four company structure, four platoon structure, which is what the French have been doing for nine months previously. We uh, rechange, we changed the way we uh, we train everyone to do all the jobs now. Because by 1916, we had right your grenadiers, your machine gunners, your your riflemen. But if the machine gunner gets killed, no one else can work machine gun. And by 1917, everyone can work everything. And that comes out of that visit, you'd imagine, because the French were already doing that. We have the visit, we write doctrine. Now we're doing it. So you could say we copied their ideas. Now maybe we didn't, but there's a compelling case to say we do. And Solly Flood's pretty pragmatic. He's been the, the CEO of the 3rd Army Officer School, and they're doing good training. And they're, do, they're not doing leadership, they're doing command. Um, and he's in the same area of the French schools. So you would imagine he might have seen what they're doing. And then as soon as he takes his one-star appointment, he goes and sees what the French are doing immediately, within a couple of months. So I think there's a lot of evidence to say we're doing the same. We certainly, by 1918, under Foch, are fighting in the same style. And when he, you know, allegedly goes into operational warfare and you know holding their reserves at arm's length, they can't. You know, we are all fighting across the the French and British and American in a similar way. Uh, I haven't had the time to look at the French doctrine. I have scratched the surface, uh, but I don't read French well enough to actually really understand what it says. I would say we were ninety percent coherent, but we did it with more style. But, but um, was that sort of officially? Um, sanctioned from the top down, or was it kind of a, an unofficial initiative of some of and others to well, it, go and look at what they were doing? And then sort we never credited the French with it. I've never found us any saying we've copied the French. Uh, I don't think we ever would any more than we would say today we've copied anyone. We wouldn't dare, would we? You know, it's just not our nature. Uh, but there is evidence in archives to show that we did. Mm. But it was, you know, we didn't write 143 saying from ideas by the French or anything like that. I just don't think we would. So uh, uh, I reckon uh, Haig et al. would have understood where it came from. And we're probably very happy because actually when we go into Unified Command, it's probably a good thing that we'll fight in the same way in a structured, relatively similar way. Mm, that's very interesting. Mm. Yeah. Ask you a question about Solly Flood because he's quite central to what you've been talking about mm. and yet we don't hear an awful lot about him in the First World War literature. Why mm. do you think that might be? Uh, I think it's because he we've never found his personal papers. They're in a box in an attic. One hopes one day we'll find them. Uh, we know him as a uh, battalion commander, we know him as a brigade deputy commander, we know him as commander 35 brigade, we know him as the CO of the uh, officer school, and, and we know of him and we know what he did and we know what his units did, but we never know what he's thinking, what he's writing. We know about his, inspect his appointment to the inspectorate, and we know what he did. So everyone knows about him, and actually, if, if you Google Solly Flood, you, you'll see him in lots of different literature. But his personal papers, of, you know, without them, we just don't really know what he was as a person. I mean, he'd, he'd gone from battalion commander to brigade commander in three years, which is very good, but sort of quite standard for a good guy in the First World War. Uh, and he made it to major general, which is pretty good. Yeah, we'd like to be a major general. Um, <laughs> um, but I just think it sadly lacks his own personal thoughts. Uh, Haig mentions him, uh, Rawlinson mentions him, yeah, they, they all mention Solid Flood. Uh, Maxi mentions him because Maxi takes a lot of his, I think, takes a lot of credit for what Solid Flood did. But that was his nature. And I, I'd imagine if he met Solid Flood, he'd be a very charming, disarming, quiet man. I wish I had. Because I think our success is built around pivots around him. So the fact that we really hear about schools and we from 1918 is, is a product of Maxi and his self-publicist. I think it's it? because he, yes. I think we, we probably know similar similar general officers who you know about, and there's some general officers you don't know about, and you had a solid flood you didn't, and you had a, I mean, there's a couple of British Army commanders now who I think are Maxi to a T, and they're at four-star level, and they're infantry, and yeah, we know who they are. Uh, and there's others that you just don't. I think I think it would be absolutely personality and big personality. Yeah. I, I wish I could be more definitive and one day if I ever find those papers yeah, and lots of people have tried. Yeah. They probably don't exist. He's probably he's probably sort of the man who probably did write them and then just chucked them away. Could think yeah. So what's the 
So have you looked at the mechanics of, say, the, the, the platoon tactics being released in January 18, printing of them, distribution of them into an army of several corps of multiple divisions of... Yes. Is, um, is there a flash to bang you have in your mind in terms of... Very quick. Very quick. The, the, there was a... Uh, it, in the first 18 months of the system, they went back to the UK to be printed. Lovely to see you. Thank you. Um, uh, and then they moved the printing presses to a lovely little village Oh, it's something like Roncy in the Sherbrooke Peninsula. I mean, a long way from the front. And they set up, they set up stationary service printing in France, uh, and they're being written in GHQ, and they're turning them out within a month. Yeah, we need a, we need a book on this. Write it, ratify it, print it. It's in the trenches within a month. You see that turnaround in 1918. It's so sad because the doctrine that was coming out at the end of 18 for 19 was brilliant. Thankfully, we never used it, but it would have been really good. Yeah, we started to write tank, tank airplane cooperation doctrine, you know, stuff that we still haven't got right today. Uh, I'm not sure you're not in uh, cavalry, are you? Yes. Yeah, you are. That's <laughs> perfect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, you know, how do tanks and close air support work? Our doctrine today is probably no further forward than it was in 1918, 1919.